It's the turn of the century in the early 2000s and Harley-Davidson's brand is becoming more popular than ever. A generation accredited for a major part of Harley-Davidson's success, the baby boomers are reaching an age where they have a large amount of discretionary income. The economy is booming, Harley-Davidson's stock is off the charts, and they can't build bikes fast enough to keep up with the demand. A new style of motorcycle began to emerge in the custom chopper genre. Nowadays oftentimes referred to as the fat wheel chopper, this style of motorcycle was spawning all kinds of custom builders all over the world. Most notably Jesse James with West Coast Choppers and the Tuttle family with Orange County Choppers. These custom fabricated choppers were oftentimes categorized by a huge fat rear tire, rigid frames, and a long raked out front end. This style of hand-built one-off choppers became a huge supplement to the increasing demand of the cruiser motorcycle industry. But these hand-built choppers weren't for everybody. A Jesse James chopper could set you back $65,000 to $150,000. Some of the world's most popular athletes, celebrities, and businesses were ordering up a chopper as either a garage ornament or an office decoration as a status symbol of success but the fat wheel chopper craze would soon come down to a crashing end. In 2008, the housing market crashed and the party was over. All of the business for these custom chopper builders would dry up overnight and they would all close their doors. These meticulously handcrafted choppers that would once cost upward of $100,000 would then become worth pennies on the dollar. And although the choppers looked amazing and delivered a radical attitude and image, people would soon realize they were horribly uncomfortable, they handled like crap, and they were never intended for serious riding. Behind the scenes, Harley-Davidson had been working on their version of the fat wheel chopper for years. But in typical Harley-Davidson fashion, they relate to the game. In 2008, when the economy was in a downward spiral, Harley-Davidson launched the Rocker and the Rocker C. The Rocker C tried to capitalize on the fat tire chopper craze of the early 2000s. Of course, Harley-Davidson did it in their way where the bike was a lot safer and a lot more rideable. This factory chopper was characterized by the big fat 240 millimeter rear tire, the raked out front end. It had the added gimmick of being able to fold up the rider seat to reveal a hidden passenger seat underneath. The engineers created this fender that was mounted to the swing arm to mimic the look of the rigid choppers that it was inspired by. But unfortunately, the Rocker was too little and too late. For most riders, there was something just visually off about the bike. The bike just never really appealed to the masses, and Harley-Davidson was trying to sell a style that had already peaked and was on its way out. Maybe it was the fact that the seat, and especially the passenger seat when you were using it, just looked like it was hovering over the rear fender. In spite of multiple aftermarket companies developing a rear fender that fixed this problem, the bike still failed, and Harley-Davidson discontinued it in 2011. But choppers always have been, and always will be, synonymous with Harley-Davidson Motor Company. So they decided to double down and give it another shot. Two years later in 2013, Harley-Davidson would launch their next attempt at the fat wheel chopper motorcycle. Except for this time, Harley-Davidson would crack the formula and they would build one of the most successful factory choppers of all time. They called it the Breakout. Hey, what's up guys? Matt here coming to you from Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. Thanks for checking out my full review and test ride on the brand new 2023 Breakout. I'm going to be giving you guys a walkthrough on this bike as my man John Terrado is setting this bad boy up. So this is the first one that we received here at Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. This is the Baja Orange. I'm going to be going over the other colors that are available this model year in just a second. So like I mentioned in the intro, the Breakout was first introduced on the old side tail platform back in 2013. It was first introduced as a CVO, which was very abnormal for the launch of a new bike. To launch a new model, 
as a CVO initially and then bring it out halfway through the model year, which is what Harley did, is a lot different than how Harley Davidson typically will launch a new model. But halfway through the 2013 model year, we saw the regular version of the breakout, which was right around that $20,000 mark. The CVO was right around that $26,000, $27,000 mark. And then that version of the breakout ran until the 2017 model year with the twin cam 103 engine in it. And then in the 18 model year, that's when we saw Harley Davidson's new soft tail frame that is still running today. And with that new soft tail chassis, we saw the introduction of the Milwaukee 8 engine into the soft tail lineup. That version of the breakout was awesome. The new frame was and still is an amazing platform. And this modern soft tail chassis that first came about in the 2018 model year, in my opinion, is the best frame that Harley Davidson has ever developed. It still maintains a lot of the core character about a Harley Davidson with the Milwaukee 8 air cooled push rod motor. It's tighter, it's lighter, it's leaner, it's meaner. It's just a great overall frame. So everything built on the soft tail platform has this newer generation soft tail chassis. And initially when the breakout came out in the 2018 model year, you could get it in both the 107 and the 114 version. It was like 12 or 1500 bucks to get the 114. And this bike ran until the 2020 model year, at which point they discontinued it in North America. The breakout was still running in the 21 model year and the 22 model year in other parts of the world like Europe and Australia. But for whatever reason, Harley Davidson did give it a two year break in North America. And now we are seeing it back and better than ever in North America in the 2023 model year. Some of the key and notable changes that they applied to it in the 23 model year is they introduced a larger tank on it. So this is Harley Davidson's five gallon fuel tank. It's the same fuel tank that we see on the other motorcycles in the soft tail family that have a five gallon fuel tank. Bikes like the Lowrider, the Fat Boy. When the breakout came out in the 2018 model year on the new soft tail platform, it had the three and a half gallon fuel tank, much like the Street Bob. I personally felt like this made a lot of sense on this bike. The smaller tank just kind of gave it a little bit more of that custom chopper feel. You could see a little bit more of the motor in the head. It's not like people were buying this to go on long distances, but I will admit a lot of the customers that came in looking at this bike, a lot of them strayed away from this bike because it only had the three and a half gallon fuel tank. And so Harley Davidson did bring back the five gallon fuel tank. This does have a new wheel on it. This is like a roulette style wheel, I think is what the designers were saying on this bike. 21 inch front wheel and an 18 inch rear wheel. Speaking of the rear wheel, you have of course the 240 millimeter rear tire, the largest tire available from the factory so you got a lot of meat in the back there it's the same as what we've seen on the fat boy in recent years and a real big feature that you have on the breakout is the 117 cubic inch displacement so you're right up there with the big boys like the st models and the cvos at this point so this bike has a very favorable power to weight ratio this bike has a running order weight of 683 pounds wet and you combine that with the milwaukee 8 117 and this thing is a grip it and rip it type of a bike which is kind of how i would categorize this motorcycle. Really the best way I could describe this bike is it is a core cruiser. It exudes the style of a factory chopper that gives off that fat chopper look that I described in the intro. And you combine that with a lot of muscle in the power plant on this thing. So if you're looking at stock Harley Davidson straight from the factory and you're looking for a type of bike that's going to be like a high profile cruise, get a lot of the looks, have something that stands out to just about everybody, including people that aren't even into motorcycles, then the breakout is probably going to be one of your top three choices in my opinion. Between the chrome and the real big intricately designed wheels and the loud paint, especially this Baja orange and the badging, this is just a bike that's made to stand out. And to the untrained eye, most people would think that you spent thousands and thousands on parts and wheels and paint and all the extra goodies and everything after the fact. So let's jump into some of the details on this bike. So with the seat, you have a really nice high-end premium look with a lot of detailed stitching and perforation and things like that in the seat. It looks like it's a two-piece, but I believe it's actually a one-piece seat. So it is two up. You do have passenger pegs on here. I would highly recommend a backrest if you're gonna put a passenger on the back because it is a narrow passenger seat. The passenger seat is what I would call a girlfriend seat, not a wife seat, if you guys know what I mean. But the seat is very appropriate for a brawler style motorcycle that definitely is trying to achieve a look. And at the $21,000 price tag, it has an attention to detail on the seat that you'd expect from a bike at this price point. The suspension is 
good. Really the best thing you can do for yourself when you really wanna figure out the ride quality of this bike is to test ride it. But it is light years better than the older generation Softail. For those of you who have been in the Harley game for a long time, if you still haven't had a chance to ride the newest generation of Softail, I would highly recommend trying one out. They are light years better in terms of ride comfort. You got that monoshock now. The Breakout is one of only three bikes that come with the external preload knob adjuster. So you can adjust the preload on the fly. Maybe you add weight, maybe you add cargo, maybe you add a passenger. You can adjust the preload on the fly so that it works better for you. In my opinion, that's a very underutilized feature on this bike. The rest of the bikes like the Lowrider ST, the Lowrider S, you actually have to lift up the seat. And those have either the wrench or the hydraulic adjuster that you need a tool to use. Moving into electronics, on a bike like this, you want to keep the electronic footprint as minimal as possible. You want to maintain the clean looks and aesthetics of a chopper motorcycle. And so Harley-Davidson executes on that very well. You've got a 2.14 inch LCD screen that is like your display for your speedometer, your gear indicator, all your warning lights, turn signals, things like that. You can cycle through this gauge for a few different options like fuel level, clock, trip range, and tachometer and things like that depending on what your preference is for your gauge. But this isn't a bike you buy for the electronics like navigation and stereo and things like that. This is a bike that tries to eliminate all that futuristic cluttered mumbo jumbo. Starting this year, this bike does have an optional traction control system. The bike in this video does not have that option. I have yet to see one of the three soft tails that come with the optional traction control this model year. The other two bikes being the Lowrider S and Lowrider ST. I will say I'm still a little unclear on exactly all of the details regarding the traction control system. We've yet to receive a soft tail equipped with the TC option. I cracked open the owner's manual and I did find a section on the traction control. So there will be a TC button somewhere in the switch housings, much like the touring bikes that have the reflex defensive rider system. As far as I can tell, the soft tails will not have the IMU, the inertial measurement unit. And so the traction control and the ABS will not be cornering enhanced. They cannot sense your lean angle. So whether or not you're in a turn. So the hardware that will be producing the data to then enable the traction control will be the wheel bearing sensors that are also used for the ABS. The website doesn't even have pricing yet on what this optional traction control is going to be. So it is a little bit surprising just how little information we have thus far on the three models that have it as a factory option, the Lowrider S, the Lowrider ST, and the Breakout. This bike does come standard with ABS braking. You do have electronic cruise control as a standard feature on the Breakout now. That was never offered in prior years, so that's definitely a welcome enhancement to the modern breakout. As far as your seating posture on this bike, you are definitely a fists forward, feet forward type of aggressive clamshell seating position on this bike. So it does have the forward controls. And so for that reason, if you're a shorter rider, you probably are gonna wanna pass on the breakout. Although you may be surprised at the low height requirement that is required to ride this bike. I would say the teetering point is right around five foot eight inches. If you're shorter than five foot eight, you might wanna consider a bike that is a mid control model. But I always recommend sitting on them and finding out for yourself. Everyone's inseam is a little bit different. You've got an LED headlamp on here, which has no housing, again, to kind of give it that just bolt right up chopper look. This is a very futuristic looking headlamp though. Probably the most futuristic looking part on the entire bike I would say. I think it goes well with the bike though. The motorcycle for the most part is a very classic looking Harley. In fact most people would argue that the form factor on this bike is just very quintessential Harley Davidson and the headlamp just gives it a little bit more of a modern feel without overstating it too much.
So let's jump into the four different paint color options on the breakout this year. So the first one, you've got vivid black and you've got a little bit of orange in there as well, it's like little highlights with a, a gray panel there. So that's your typical black, vivid black without the additional upcharge. And then denim black here. We haven't seen denim black used in recent years as much as they used to use it. So it's nice to see a denim color return to the Harley Davidson lineup, especially on a breakout. They haven't used denim too much on breakouts in the past. And Baja orange, of course, this is the color that we see here in the video that I'm doing my test ride on. And the fourth and final color is called Atlas Silver Metallic. You can see you got some blue in there. That's like a highlight color. I, I like the black denim personally. I like the orange too. I mean, the orange just kind of goes with the appeal of, of the loud, bold nature of this bike. In terms of pricing on this thing, a base price of $20,999. And then depending on what color you go with, you've got an upcharge. So the three colors, the black denim, the Baja orange, and the Atlas silver, you've got a $525 upcharge to the MSRP. The other fees that we see from the manufacturer are the surcharge. The surcharge is $750. Again, that was due to inflation in recent years where they had an increase in cost of raw materials. And so that's basically there as hopefully a temporary fee. We'll see. And freight is $700 on soft sales this year. You have the $200 California emissions charge. You have rider safety enhancements. ABS is an included feature on this bike. But then you have the traction control system. It says that's optional and we don't have a price associated with that. So it's kind of interesting. Once again, I don't know how much this is gonna cost if you want that option. We can jump into some performance specs here. So engine torque on this thing, 123 foot pounds of torque, not too shabby at all. That is a powerful beast right there. I'm sure that's at the crank. And horsepower, this is very interesting guys. Harley Davidson up until this point has never really published horsepower. So they're throwing up the 101 horsepower at 4750 rpm and I, I looked real quick to see the other bikes to see if every bike is publishing horsepower now and most of them still are not publishing horsepower so not sure why they felt the need to publish it on the breakout but i i would welcome it even though you know harley davidson's they're not these horsepower kings because again they're air-cooled motors they don't rev up really high so they don't have like these really high horsepower numbers which is fine but for whatever reason i don't they just that's not something they brag about they brag about their torque because they are torque monsters. Now let's talk for a minute about how this bike rides. Much like most fat tire choppers, the breakout is very much like a drag style, open the throttle up and burn some rubber in a straight line type of bike. The 117 puts out plenty of torque to have you smiling all the way up to about 115 miles where the bike is electronically governed. So the breakout is just a really fun bike to rip around town, stoplight to stoplight, rip down the freeway for a short burst. The 34 degree rake in the front forks makes it even more stable in a straight line. So this thing's like a missile going down the freeway. Speaking of freeway, this bike definitely isn't my first choice if I were to ride from Los Angeles to Sturgis or something like that. It'll do it, don't get me wrong, there's just better tools in the shed for that. As you would expect, the 240 millimeter rear tire makes the bike a little bit slower in and out of the turns. Getting that big fat piece of rubber up on the sidewall requires a little bit more body language, but once you get used to it, it's really not that bad. If you ride a bike like the Fat Bob or the Lowrider S back to back with the Breakout, those bikes are gonna feel a lot more nimble transitioning in and out of turns from lean angle to lean angle. Just a little bit easier to ride and a little bit more intuitive handling. So at your typical 90 degree turn, like at a stoplight or something like that, you just won't be taking those turns quite as fast as you would on something else that had a narrower tire but you can't even begin to compare this to some of the custom choppers of old like I mentioned in the intro these bikes handle like a dream compared to some of those early 2000s custom belt choppers the breakouts gonna do just fine on long mild sweeping canyon turns and things like that however if you start getting to really tight canyon turns like hairpin style turns the breakout is gonna be a little bit more of a chore to ride so there's definitely better bikes for that type of riding out there than the breakout 
So sometimes I like to cover like the core accessories that are available for different models just because that gives you a little bit better idea of exactly what type of utility you're going to get out of the different bikes that you're looking at. So on the breakout, if you're looking for comfort, this is the seat to get. This is called the Harley Hammock Touring Seat. This is a seat that will fit the breakout. So you can see here, it's gonna add quite a bit of padding to the seat. So some people might argue that, okay, well that kills the look of the bike. Well, yeah, maybe, but you're also gonna be comfortable if you plan on doing like three, four or 500 mile day. And you know, if you're gonna ride with a passenger, really one of the best things you can get for your passenger hands down is the backrest. So most people don't buy the breakout for touring reasons, but if you did wanna throw the bigger seat on there and throw a passenger seat on there for the you know two or three or four times that you ride with two up long distance in a year, then I would say, you know, go with this setup. If you're someone that rides long distance frequently, then I would probably say, you know what, the breakout it's probably not the best bike in the world for you, but you can make it work, I suppose, if you really wanted to. As far as windshields go, you've got a few different size options here. A lot of these are the quick release ones that just uh, clamp on to the, the fork tubes, the upper fork tubes here. So you got a 14 inch, an 18 inch, and a 19 inch here. These are pretty nice because again, they are quick detach. And if you're going on like a, a longer freeway ride, going down the highway for a long time, maybe you're going out with the boys, whatever and you want to have a little bit better wind deflection then a windshield is like a godsend when you're out there on the highway doing 65 miles an hour plus for a long distance most guys are really going for that stripped down chopper look on a breakout but you do have this in a pinch and then if you're looking for a storage solution for your breakout you can always go with the hd detachable locking saddlebags these will set you back just shy of a thousand bucks but these things are super nice and they're a heck of a lot better than a lot of the aftermarket stuff out there both right on just the the quality and fit and finish of these are really nice so um, good option here again i don't see that too often on breakouts a lot of times guys don't want that clutter they want to show off the wheel they want to show off that bobbed fender and all that stuff but again if you're looking to get some bags for whatever that that overnight or you plan on doing on your breakout this would be a pretty good option for you if you wanted to do something really small for just like maybe gloves and sunglasses or something like that you could always go with the single-sided swing arm bag maybe throw like a hat in there or something like that but i don't believe these are lockable so you always run the risk of someone you know jumping in there and, and stealing your stuff So all things considered, the bike, the accessories that are available for the bike, the culmination of everything, I'd say the weaknesses of this bike are long distance comfort, razor sharp handling, and an abundance of storage options. But I think most people looking at this bike aren't really considering it for those things. What this bike does really well is it's just a great showpiece. It looks amazing. It's undeniably a Harley Davidson. It's got that muscle drag bike power. Slap a pipe on this thing and it just turns into a beast. If I personally own this bike, I would substitute out my street glide for quick rips around town, throw the wife on the back, go down to a local restaurant, maybe shoot down to the beach, things like that. But anytime I'm going on a long ride, say maybe more than 250 miles, or if I'm going out of town and doing like overnighters, the breakout's definitely gonna stay in the garage. All right guys, let me get the quick and dirty on your, your thoughts about the new 23 model year breakout. Mickey, what'd you think? I like it, man, that 117. It's, uh, it's something different. So we took the other one, we switched back and forth, the twin cam, I miss the twin cam, but that 117 works out, and the color's pretty. And this is the first time I've ridden a twin cam, but I have ridden the 107 and the 114. We've had them here from time to time used and stuff like that, but uh, this, is, this is my first time uh, twin cam and this one, so I'm pretty impressed, man. It, I originally thought it wasn't going to be a comfortable bike. It's a pretty comfortable bike. I could ride it. Honestly, it's the M8. I just love the M8. I'm a huge fan. There's not really a comparison between the old breakout and the new breakout. Like the old breakout looks good. Like it, it, it does what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be like you roll up after, you know, or you roll up anywhere and everyone looks at the bike and goes, wow, that's a cool looking Harley. And it sounds good. The twin cams always sound good, but 
then you hop on the new one and it's like oh god like it's clear the frames were designed in different centuries and you know the new one holds its line a lot better the front end doesn't feel nearly as floppy because i mean anytime you get a lot of rake and a big 21 inch heavy front wheel like with a 240 millimeter rear tire you've got to do a lot of engineering to make that bike not handle really well let's just say like it sounds if you give those specs and the breakout hides its rake it hides its 240 millimeter rear tire the new one that is a lot better than the old one ever did i don't know to what degree any of like the fxdr's dna is in there because the fxdr was one of those bikes i got on and i was like wow for what this bike looks like on paper this handles way better than it should and the new breakout kind of reminds me of that in a lot of ways Thanks a lot for watching guys. If I was able to give you some helpful information, make sure to hit that like button. If you like Harley Davidson content like this, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can be notified of all my future videos. As always, if you're looking for a Harley Davidson in Southern California, make sure you hit us up here at Laidlaw's Harley Davidson in Baldwin Park, California, just east of Los Angeles. We'll see you on the next one guys. Later.